Okay, so let's get started. Um, so I want to start by just saying welcome to everybody and particularly welcome to the panelists we have here today for the Poverty Solutions Summit. And this is particularly the public banking panel. And um, I have Oscar Abello here, Trinity Tran, and Raul Carillo. Um, so just let's dive right in. So my name is Jordan Brooks, and I'm a first year law student in the MDJD program at the University of Miami, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, so we're gonna be talking a lot about public banking. And so I wanted to just start off with a brief introduction into what public banking is. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with public banking, as I was prior to working with Catalyst, uh, public banks are banks owned by a governmental subdivision, such as a state, county, city, or tribe, in which public funds are deposited. And when I say public funds, I mean monies of the state, city, or municipalities collected from taxes, fees, etc. So the state's money going into a bank, not individual depositors as most people tend to think of banks. So generally these banks are mandated to serve a public mission. So currently the state of North Dakota has had a state public bank since the early 1900s. And the issue of public banking has resurfaced and become a hot topic recently as California passed a bill allowing public banks at the county and the municipal level um, and at least five states are currently pursuing public bank initiatives. And there's also been a federal proposal um, proposed by AOC and some of the progressive Democrats. So I'm currently working with Ahmed Mori, the Senior Director of Community Economic Development at Catalyst Miami on a project researching two issues surrounding public banks. Uh, so the first question we asked was, about the legality of public banks in Florida. Uh, we looked at the state, county, but we really focused on the municipal level and what the limitations were to chartering a bank in Florida. Uh, we're still in the process of completing that, but it is likely public banks are legal with the right legislation in place. And the second question we looked at was what should be included in a proposal for public bank legislation. And I just wanted to note a few important items that need to be considered and that will be probably expanded upon later in the panel. Um, but in particular, legislation should focus on providing guidance on ownerships and governance structure. It has to focus on uh, how banks will ensure the deposits that are put into the bank. Uh, whether they will extend service to underbanked individuals and transparency in reference to public records associated with these public banks. Uh, I also looked more broadly at the public policy issues surrounding the public banks. And in, this con in conducting this research, I was very intrigued by public banks' ability to strengthen community banks and credit unions while simultaneously divesting from Wall Street banks allowing the public to save money in interest payments and increasing loans to less fortunate individuals and small businesses. They also possess the ability to potentially serve underbanked individuals, similar to postal banking as we saw in California and highly relevant to the current pandemic. I was also intrigued by public banks' ability to serve as emergency lenders to community banks and credit unions and rescue small businesses in times of need. And we saw this in countries like Germany and even in North Dakota uh, during this pandemic. But all this is just a little bit of my research. And today we are very fortunate to have some very interesting people who have worked on the front lines of implementing public banks here in America. And I am very excited to have you all here uh, to consider this potentially very powerful community economic development measure. I wanted to thank you all for your attendance today and say I'm honored to be a part of this initiative. So without further ado, I will introduce our wonderful panelists. So first up, we have Oscar Abeo. Uh, and as a senior economics correspondent, Oscar covers policies, programs, and businesses that seek to address historical disparities in access to jobs, capital, and space for economic use in cities. He previously served as Next Cities editor from 2018 to 2019, and when was a Next City Equitable Cities fellow from 2015 to 2016. 
So since 2011, Oscar has covered stories on topics such as community development finance, community banking, community land trust, uh, the social safety net, and more. He has also previously spoken at gatherings such as the Grounded Solutions Network, National Conference, and the Transform Finance Institute for Social Justice Leaders. Oscar has also guest lectured or presented at the CUNY Graduate Center's Urban Studies Program, the Pratt Institute, the University of Michigan's Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning, and many other programs. So next up, we have Trinity Tran. Uh, in February 2017, Trinity Tran created Divest LA, which successfully mobilized activists behind the campaigns to move the city of Los Angeles' public funds from Wells Fargo. In June 2017, she co-founded Public Bank LA, which led the Measure B ballot initiative to create a city-owned bank in Los Angeles. In June 2018, she became a founding member of the California Public Banking Alliance and led organizers for the statewide coalition of grassroots groups, which conceived and sponsored state legislative bill AB 857 to create local public banks in California. The Public Banking Act was signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom in October of 2019. CBPA is now working on 2021 legislation to create a California State Public Bank. Last, we have Raul Carrillo, and Raul is the Deputy Director of the LPE Project and an Associate Research Scholar at Yale Law School. His resource, also supported by the NYU Center for Race and Digital Studies, focuses on money as a tool of governance, surveillance, and control. Prior to joining the LPE project, Raul was policy counsel at the Demand Progress Education Fund and a fellow at the Americans for Financial Reform Education Fund, advertising or advising rather public interest groups with respect to developments in financial technology. He previously worked as a staff attorney at New Eco Economy Project and special counsel to the enforcement director at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He is the chair of the board of directors of the Modern Money Network. So those are our three panelists. So how's it, how it's gonna work is each panelist will have approximately 15 minutes. Um, and at the end, we will reserve 15 minutes for question and answer and invite people to, and I invite people to type their questions into the chat and I will ask those at the end of the um, uh, Trinity and so Trinity, can you tell us about your involvement in bringing public banking to California? How did the proposal come about, and how did Public Bank Los Angeles factor into the larger California Public Bank Banking Alliance? How did the California Public Banking Alliance secure such a big legislative win, and what is the next step for the CBPA? Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so I've been a volunteer activist in the financial space for, for quite a few years now. And it started, you know, as you mentioned in my bio, in 2017 with Divest LA, uh, where we created a campaign, a grassroots campaign uh, that was aimed at um, divesting the city of Los Angeles from Wells Fargo, which uh, was a bank that the city primarily banked with. And of course, a bank with a long laundry list of exploitative uh, behavior against uh, harming communities of color and redlining, uh, illegal foreclosures. Um, so what we did was by, you know, because essentially by virtue of our city's money sitting in a bank like Wells Fargo, we uh, as Angelinos were essentially complicit to these crimes against the community. So we fought, we, uh, within the less than a year, we were able to successfully, uh, succeed, we succeeded in evicting Wells Fargo from the city's commercial banking services. So the California public banking movement and uh, the California Public Banking Alliance really is uh, the legacy of this work, this national divestment movement and um, our collective work across California with activists um, trying to divest our public funds from these predatory extractive private banks and that was done 
um, in, in, in solidarity with Standing Rock. And that was a fight, as some of you may remember, back in 20, at the end of 2016, 20, 2017, where Indigenous groups were fighting to defend their land and water from, from oil pipelines and, and trying to defund these banks that were financing these oil projects. So um, we realized the, cha the challenges um, early on in the campaign that there were only a few, uh, th 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 there were only a number of banks large enough to be able to handle the city's financial uh, the financial needs, especially the city, a city the size of Los Angeles. And and you know, not surprisingly, these banks are your largest private Wall Street banks. You, you know, including Union Bank, U.S. Bank, uh, Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, and and most of the, uh, if not all of these banks, have been handed violations and civil penalties by. The Department of Justice. So we knew that we had to fight for another alternative, and that the final form of divestment wasn't just for us to divest our money from Wells, Wells Fargo and move it to another large Wall Street bank. It was to uh, divest from Wall Street and create a public bank. So we took a relatively unknown idea at the time, and we drummed up a lot of energy behind it, and and helped move the public banking conversation onto the national scale with, with Measure B, uh, the ba Measure B ballot initiative, which is another grassroots campaign that we led in Los Angeles. Um, and with Measure B, we were able to mobilize uh, city support behind this ballot measure in 2018. And we, we were the first city um, in the nation to actually ask that, uh, voters to approve uh, taking the first steps towards uh, public bank, and that would be by amending uh, one section of the LA City Charter. Uh, we had just about four months to organize and about less than a tenth of the budget that you would need to win a ballot measure in the city the size of Los Angeles. And uh, it was an entirely volunteer-led campaign, and we still managed to get 44% of the vote and 430,000 people in, Angel in Los Angeles saying yes to a public bank. So after Measure B, we... Um, we, we knew that we had planted a seed, so we, we took that momentum and immediately started organizing a large-scale effort uh, to create public banks across the state of, of California. So we formed the California Public Banking Alliance in 2018, and um, that was around the central goal of being able to create a pathway for local public banks. Um, uh, there were already public banking groups uh, in the state. Um, that were in various preliminary stages of, of organizing for a public bank at the local level. So we said instead of, you know, grassroots organizers in different cities trying to create their own separate legislation, it made sense for us to pull together our resources and our organizing power to, to back one state bill. So we conceived of and rewrote AB 857, um, and that bill would streamline the process of creating the regulatory framework uh, and the legal framework for city and regional public banks across California. Um, but I do want to say it's important to raise that even uh, without a deep understanding of finance. And most, uh, you know, I don't have a finance background. Most in the alliance do not. We ha we're lucky to have uh, legal experts and financial experts as part of the alliance. But it's important to understand that even if you don't have a, a deep understanding of the financial system because it has it been intentionally created to be complex, uh, most people understand that Wall Street banks have, have created uh, widespread devastation and public banking comes in as being able to provide a, a real and a viable alternative to um, empowering the community, empowering community-led, community-controlled initiatives instead of billions of our tax dollars getting siphoned um, out of our communities by, by out-of-state mega banks. Um, this is a way to refunnel and recapture those funds to be able to to, to invest in the long term um, sustainability and regeneration of our communities. Because you know, from fossil fuel investments, um, funding private prisons, uh, immigrant detention centers, these are the very same private, big private Wall Street banks that hold uh, billions of of dollars of uh, our deposits and investments of, from our city and state taxpayer dollars. So this is, public banks allow us to, to be able to recapture the interest that we pay to these bondholders, be able to refinance the city debt and, and recirculate that money back into the local economy. So it's, a, it's really about taking the power of money um, back for our communities. And um, another important note is to add that it's, you know, nearly 50% of the cost of all infrastructure costs goes toward projects goes towards paying bank interest and fees. Um, I'll use LA example. Here in LA, we spend more on banking fees than we do on fixing our crumbling streets, which is absolutely unacceptable. Um, when LA County passed uh, 
uh, Proposition HHH. It authorized about a billion dollars in general obligation bonds for the development of up to uh, 10,000 supportive housing units for, for people experiencing homelessness. And it was estimated that 693 million out of that 1 billion um, uh, in general obligation bonds, 693 million, more than 50% of that would go towards paying private investors over time. Um, that's $693 million getting funneled out of our communities. So if we were able to fund projects ourselves through a public bank, we can literally half the cost of infrastructure uh, of for infrastructure and initiatives and, and be able to double our power to invest in our communities. And, um, you know, it provides, it's a really, for how we see it, it's a very common sense and, and logical solution to uh, a solution to the, the harms caused by private mega banks. Because uh, when you invest wealth locally, it's our communities um, that benefit. So um, back to the fight. So we formed California Public Banking Alliance um, as, as an alliance of organizers and activists from 10 cities, from, Cal from, from San Diego to LA, to Santa Cruz, uh, to Santa Rosa, San Jose, Oakland, San Francisco, um, all the way up to Eureka. And our mission was to create a network of uh, socially and environmentally responsible public banks and creating an alternative system um, to help serve the most disadvantaged populations. And that really is a, a central and a key focus of our work. Um, ultimately, we believe it in so much that we do this all as volunteers. Um, so California's new AB 857 law that we passed in 2019 creates the framework for uh, public banks, city and regional public banks to be regulated. Um, and these regulations are, are still in the process of being defined by California's Department of Financial Protection and Innovation, D DFPI. Um, and these banks are going to have the same financial uh, and regulatory requirements as commercial banks. Um, also, uh, the AB 857 public banks, uh, similar to credit unions, will be exempt from taxes. Um, and like public agencies, they will be subject to the Brown Act and the Public Records Act, which will um, go a long way in helping ensure that the banks are going to be run transparently um, with good governance and a, a real commitment to the public interest. And the public AB 857 public banks are gonna have oversight on four levels. Um, one from the independent board of directors of the bank, two, the local agency owner of the bank, three is uh, California's DFPI, and then the FDIC. Um, so the, quickly, just the process of creating a public bank through this new law, um, it requires a multi-step process before a public bank license is granted. Um, first, that lo the local agency, either a city or a county, um, has to create a business plan where the governance and technical aspects of the banks are going to be laid out. And then that business plan has to be voted on by, and approved um, by the local governing body before it's submitted to the DP, DBO and FDIC uh, for approval. So it will be a few years before one is off the ground, but um, you know, cities that, uh, and regions in LA are already moving and taking steps towards creating it. But uh, uh, back a little bit on how we achieved, accomplished this win to land this win. We coordinated strategy um, among our statewide alliance and, and focused on uh, key stakeholders with huge constituencies across the, the state. We rallied and got 17 cities and counties in California to pass resolutions to endorse AB 857, uh, along with the Democratic Central Committees. Um, we worked on strategy with our lead authors in the assembly, assembly members, uh, Miguel Santiago and David Chu, uh, to mobilize constituents in target districts to pressure legislators. Uh, we built a, a, quite an impressive list of legislative endorsements with, from over 200 statewide, regional, um, and community organizations, including labor, and uh, really built a citizens lobbying team um, that it was able to lobby both in district and at the state capitol, um, again, all as volunteers, to, to help educate legislators um, along with constituents on, on the benefits of public banking. Um, so at, at the end of 2019, uh, the bill was signed by Governor Newsom, and, and that was really an incredible feat um, and proved that with organizing and strategy and collective work from an unfunded volunteer coalition, um, you know, we were able to help transform or take the first steps to transforming um, such an, an, an institution as embedded as banking um, to help pave the way for for a, a more evolved um, and a more equitable 
system. So after the bill passed, the Alliance cities were focused on creating their city level banks, but then in early um, in early last year in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. So uh, now in the middle of a pandemic, cities, uh, counties um, face this uh, incredible uphill battle of having to rebuild entire sections of the economy. Um, uh, you're seeing this in cities and, ca and, and, and counties across the country who are being hard hit from devastation from loss of sales tax, uh, hotel tax revenue. Um, and that just increases the likelihood of public services, public schools um, being impacted, um, as well as so, uh, social safety net programs being cut. So the question we're faced with now is how will states um, be able to fill in their budget gaps so that we can have uh, a, health, a quick and a healthy recovery um, to help small businesses get back on their feet, to create affordable housing, to build infrastructure, um, to distribute systems that people need, especially hard hit uh, communities of color. Um, because as we saw unfold in 2020, big banks shut small businesses out of PPP loans. Those were given, uh, the lending priorities for those, those loans were given to uh, people with established uh, relationships with the big banks to big business clients. So um, the only public bank in the US, the Bank of North Dakota, that when Oscar uh, jumps on and, and is able to explain a little bit further is the, is the only public bank in the United States and it also distributed more PPP loans than any other state because it doesn't have leakages uh, or with it doesn't have a huge fees of Wall Street banks. So they were able to um, deploy capital uh, both quickly and efficiently to help small businesses get back on their feet. So uh, essentially when you cut out Wall Street as a middleman, you have more money to address the basic needs of the community. So now CPBA, California Public Banking Alliance, is, is working on AB 310, you know, as the COVID crisis has, has shown, there has there really is no current currently there is no path towards a quick recovery and that's why it, it really is making a strong case for the need of, of public banking um, so we're working on 310 and this is the California state public bank bill um, the bill is currently being written by our team um, we're also working on bringing on co-authors and co-sponsors um, this is going to be this was initially introduced um, last year during the pandemic um, as a way to help um, uh, help local AB 85 capitalize local AB 857 public banks and lend to small businesses and local governments um, to help with COVID recovery. So it's getting because of the truncated legislative session, um, it's getting reintroduced in the next few weeks uh, in the California State Legislature. And and this this new uh, our, our new bill will uh, the new version of AB 310 will will lay the out the foundation. Um, to convert the existing California infrastructure bank, the what's known as the I Bank, um, to turn it into a, a full-scale depository public bank and, and expand the mandate of the I Bank so that it can help with um, equitable lending to small businesses, local governments, affordable housing developments, um, climate change mitigation, wildfire mitigation. Those are issues that are very important here to address in California. It'll also expand capital to community development financial institutions, CDFIs, um, and, and help uh, provide technical assistance to AB 857 uh, city and regional local public banks. Um, and again, this, is, this takes a more incremental approach to creating the state public bank that um, over time, will be able to help increase the lending capacity of local public banks and credit unions and um, deploy money uh, back to our community in a way that's uh, without having to rely on Wall Street. And another reason why public banks are a powerful tool for recovery efforts is that they would be able to multiply um, the impact of public banking by leveraging the bank's capital up to 10 times um, into recovery loans. Uh, so the way we envision it is the state public bank will work with local AB 57 public banks to be able to fill in um, gaps in the market where, where Wall Street banks have, have failed to provide the needed capital. Um, so we are now working on AB 310 and uh, that should be reintroduced. Our second landmark bill in just a few weeks. Uh, you can visit CaliforniaPublicBankingAlliance.org and sign up for our mailing list. Um, to stay updated on the bill's introduction and then follow our progress as we're moving through the legislature. So what's up next? Um, 
we're, you know, we're, we're really excited with this moment because we're seeing such incredible energy and political support building in the public banking space. So with the state public bank, California State Public Bank, AB 310, um, that's happening this legislative session in 2021. And then also here in Los Angeles, we're working now working with LA City Council to build the Bank of Los Angeles, which we're aiming to be the first city owned public bank in the country. And we're holding a, a public bank LA town hall at the end of this month on, on Tuesday, uh, February 23rd at 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, we are announcing that uh, next week that it's going to, we're going to have incredible progressive leaders from LA City Council member Mike Bonin, uh, former state senator and LA City Council member Kevin DeLeon, Council member Nithya Raman. Um, and also joining us are allied labor groups like UFCW, United Food and Commercial Workers Union, Local 770, which have been tremendous and in, in, uh, have done tremendous work representing about 30,000 um, frontline grocery and retail drug workers here in Los Angeles. Uh, and also ACE will be joining us and they've done um, incredible uh, community work with frontline communities and affordable housing. So with uh, our Public Bank LA Town Hall at the end of the month, if you're trying to start to uh, a, a movement in your city, um, come jo join us, go to publicbankla.com and sign up for our mailing list at the bottom of the page um, to stay updated on our movement and, and next steps with City Hall. And uh, as always, reach out to either California Public Banking Alliance or Public Bank LA to, to ga gain some more resources and, and we'll do whatever we can to help you uh, get your movement off the street, uh, off of uh, jumpstart your, your movement. Um, and we're also excited in the next few months um, we'll be helping support, organize and support around the National Public Banking Act. And this was announced in October, um, and it's going to be reintroduced um, around this April uh, with Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Rashida Tlaib. And um, this bill would essentially make it easier to create public banks across the U.S., which Raul um, helped write in and is going to discuss in this next segment. Um, so we're at Wednesday. We're we're really excited about the future and what it holds. Um, I think it's important to realize that we have the ability to create prosperity for all, and and we have the ability to create uh, a just system for all. Um, one where poor people don't have to suffer, one where our earth isn't destroyed. And it really comes down to being able to control the money supply. Um, the, this system, the current system of finance isn't working because it is based on extraction and greed and exploitation. Um, because, you know, on the one hand, we have a private model and profit or resources are getting drained um, out of our communities by out of state ma mega banks. And what we're attempting to create uh, nationwide is, is a public model where interest and profit um, belongs to their community and, and can be our wealth can be collectively shared and reinvested um, for the long term sustainability and regeneration of, of our, our communities and our, our cities and states and regions. Um, we see public banking really as the cornerstone of the progressive movement, um, being able to to fund um, solutions for homelessness, for affordable housing, for renewable energy. Um, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we can't depend on private developers to address basic human needs like housing and the right to affordable housing, just like we can't depend on the fossil fuel industry to take us to net carbon, net zero carbon. They don't have an incentive to, to build and to design uh, for the interest of all people, for the interest of the greater good. And we're now at a, a really important and crucial moment in history to be able to transform this economy um, to one that's human-centered rather than just purely profit-centered um, so that we can create a new system that's, that's evolved, that's based on not just maximizing profit, but actually maximizing um, the impact of profit. So we're, uh, we look, we've got a lot of work cut out for us, but um, we look forward to building for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Trinity. That was awesome. Great to hear the work that's going on in California, truly revolutionary. So thank you for sharing uh, your work with us. So now we're going to go back to Oscar uh, and uh, just to remind Oscar of these questions that I had asked initially. Uh, so if you could just provide us a brief historic overview of public banking in the United States, tell us a little bit about what public banking is and then what makes uh, the Bank of North Dakota 
successful and what can other public banking efforts in the U.S. learn from it? Okay. I hope you can hear me now. Can hear me now? We can hear you. Perfect. Okay, okay. Uh, sorry for, uh, sorry. Um, for the technical issues earlier. Uh, yeah, so we're talking about, once again, just to be clear, we're talking about banks where not, it's not the, uh, some unit of government, state, local, or tribal governments would, would own the bank and it would deposit its money in that bank as an alternative to where it, deposit, it currently does, it deposits and does its, does its banking. You know, for instance, in Philadelphia, it's Citizens Bank. In San Francisco, most of its bank accounts are at Bank of America. Um, in New York City, most of its bank, most of its deposits are in Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase. So uh, we're not talking about moving new dollars from from cities or states into something new. We're uh, into into some kind of new ent um, uh, uh, program that that would be that states and cities would run. It's a new. It's a whole new bank. Right. So, so these are just bank accounts that are moving into a state owned or city owned or county or tribal owned bank. Um, everything from payroll processing, uh, all the taxes and fees and revenues that get deposited. You know, the, the, the reason I, the, the, in North Dakota, by law, the state, all of the state taxes and fees and revenues get deposited in the Bank of North Dakota. Right, so so it's um it's a it's a it's an eight billion dollar bank. Um, it has around I think it's four to five billion dollars in deposits from the state that are deposited in the Bank of North Dakota, and just like other banks, it, it, the, these new public banks would leverage those dollars to create new loans, new money for public purposes that are designated, you know, by the public. And in, in North Dakota, you know, in 1919, uh, when the bank was started, it, it was still largely an agrarian state, just like it is today. And the farmers in North Dakota were pretty, were upset that the bankers in Chicago and New York uh, were, were stiffing them, you know, giving them high interest rate loans. You know, it's, you need, you need credits in, in farming and agriculture, right? Because, because you only, there's one harvest or two harvests a year, and what do you do in between to, to plant the seeds, plant the crops, pay the laborers, uh, buy all the materials and everything you need to farm? So farm, banking and farming have always been intertwined for thousands of years. And in North Dakota in 1919, uh, it was actually a couple of years earlier that, that you know, there was this uh, socialist party called the Nonpartisan League that uh, one power one one won the legislature and the governorship in North Dakota. And in 1919, they created two things, actually. They created a, a state-owned bank and they created a state-owned grain mill and elevator. And both of those state-owned enterprises are still operating today and they're still very profitable. Uh, this, the, the bank in North Dakota had 16 straight years of record profits uh, until 2020. Um, 2020 was obviously was a down year, just like for me, for a lot of institutions. But 2020 was still a top five, top five most profitable year ever for the Bank of North Dakota. And where did the Bank of North Dakota's profits go? They go back into the state, and they also they, some of them stay with the bank to reinvest in the in the bank's growth. So uh, since since its creation in 1919, the Bank of North Dakota has paid back over a billion dollars now. In, in profits back to the state of North Dakota. Um, how does it work? So how does the Bank of North Dakota work? Um, I had the good fortune to actually visit North Dakota and talk to North Dakota small business owners and also North Dakota community bankers about, you know, what is it like to actually be, be you, to be a community banker in North Dakota and have this thing around. And they were all excited about it. You know, they 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 were excited to talk to me about their their state-owned bank in North Dakota, because it, as a bank, it has a model of partnering with private lenders, community lenders, community banks, and credit unions. It doesn't compete with them. You know, it's actually written into the to the law, the original law passed in 1919, and many of and most of the I, th I think the, all the laws I've seen so far to establish public banks. 
Um, you know, there's there's Philadelphia introduced the law to establish public bank last week. San Francisco is doing introduced their law. Washington, Oregon, Washington State, I should say, uh, the state of Oregon, and also the state of New Mexico on Monday just introduced their law to establish a public bank. And one of the common themes taking their cue from North, from the bank in North Dakota is the bank, the state-owned bank or the municipally-owned bank will not compete with private lenders. It will partner with them. And how does it do that? So in North Dakota, I met a grocery store owner uh, in Fargo. He's, uh, he's an Iraqi immigrant and his co-owner is a, is a Jordanian immigrant. You know, they're recent arrivals to the U.S. And they started this grocery store a few years ago and they were renting the store and they were renting the equipment in the store. And they wanted a loan to buy the building and buy the equipment. Uh, and they got a loan eventually, $250,000 from Cornerstone Banks, which is a, bank, a community bank in North Dakota. And they're paying less in, in, they're paying less in monthly payments on their loan than they were paying in monthly rent for the building and the equipment from, from before. So they got that loan and I, and I talked to the community bank I said, and I asked them, so this, for this loan, um, did you finance it all by yourself? And the answer was no. The, they financed part of the loan from the Bank of North Dakota. So what happens behind the scenes in North Dakota is when you, when the, when you go to a bank to get a small business loan and, the banks, the, and, you, and you, you ask for the bank for $250,000, let's say, uh, the bank may only be willing to risk a hundred thousand, seventy-five thousand, uh, or maybe a hundred fifty thousand uh, uh, on you, but it may be a, it may it may think you're you can pay back the two hundred fifty thousand. Um, and the reason why the bank can only risk one hundred fifty thousand is there, there's a there's a regulation that all banks have to face. They're called legal lending limits, right? There's only so much. Uh, a bank is able to lend to any particular borrower. But in North Dakota, instead of saying, no, we can't give you 250,000, we can only give you 150,000. Um, in North Dakota, you can go to the state-owned bank behind the scenes and say, can you supply the rest of the borrowed amount that this borrower is requesting? So um, in, in 2019, I think the, uh, the bank of North Dakota made, uh, you know, it makes hundreds of loans a year and most of those loans are participation loans where the local lender originates the transaction and sells part of the loan to the bank of North Dakota behind the scenes. And what does this do? This means the local bank, the community lender, uh, maintains the relationship with the borrower. You know, the, this, this grocery store owner had, didn't even realize that the bank of North Dakota came in behind the scenes. Um, it, it it all it, to the to the borrowers it all it looks like one loan from one from your community bank, but your community bank is able to make more of these loans, because the bank of North Dakota is able to come in behind the scenes and take and take on some of the some of the some of the principal that that the local bank can't can't provide on its own. And you know this is all this is this is this sounds a lot really sophisticated and complicated, which is why a lot of it a lot of it gets handled internally by the banks, right? So the community bank is saying, we believe in you. Um, we just don't have the, the, the ability to lend, you, lend to you as much as you're looking for, but don't worry about it. We're gonna, we're gonna work it out anyway. And they work with the Bank of North Dakota to work it out. So um, this, this is how the Bank of North Dakota, North Dakota does it. Most of it's small business loans, loans to farmers, um, loans to, to small manufacturers. You know, I met in North Dakota, I met the, uh, the, the co-owner of the first commercial CBD processing plant in North Dakota. Uh, she's a black woman and they were planning to go to the, to, go, to work with their local lender and the bank of North Dakota to, to, to supply some of the capital for their, their operations, uh, in Fargo. Um, the, you know, and the, the, the key thing, one of the key things that uh, the North Dakota Bankers Association themselves told me about the Bank of North Dakota is um, it's really it's really run by bankers. You know, it's run by community bankers, right? You know, there's 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 there, 
it's, it's run by people with this orientation of being a community bank, taking deposits from the community, lending to that same community, and making capital available broadly in that sense. And so, and, and, and it's really run by bankers. It's not run by politicians, right? It's not politicians going in and approving every loan or approving every project that the Bank of North Dakota finances. Um, it's it's a bank and it's run by bankers and it's run by, and it's run for the, the the local banks and credit unions in North Dakota who all partner with with the Bank of North Dakota to to to, to make loans. Um, what else is important to say? The and what what's the result of all this um, in North Dakota? So in North Dakota, what you what you find is there are more banks per capita in North Dakota than any other state. So it's a small state. It's only about 760,000 people, but you have 75 banks in North Dakota, not branches. I'm talking about banking entities. There's 75 of them. And that, and that means there's about one bank for every 10,000 people in North Dakota. And that's the lowest ratio of any state. You know, uh, we're talking about Florida. In Florida, there's one bank for every 195,000 people in Florida. In, uh, in New York, I'm based in New York, it's one bank for every 143,000 people. Uh, in Arizona, it's one bank for every 478,000 people. Uh, so yeah, in North Dakota, like I said, it's one bank for every 10,000 people. So what you have, because of the Bank of North Dakota and its model of partnering with community lenders, uh, you have a stronger community bank sector in North Dakota than any other part of the country. Like community banks, in North Dakota take most and have most of the deposits across the state uh, rel in, as opposed to, you know, your Wells Fargo's or your Bank of America's or your J.P. Morgan Chase's, it's, you know, community banks dominate in North Dakota. Um, it's really funny, in, in Fargo, uh, in downtown, downtown in Fargo, the main drag, is, it's actually called Broadway. And uh, like building by building, the, the, the tall buildings in downtown North Dakota you know, are the are the community banks serving the region, right? It, it, it's like Bell Bank, um, uh, other bank, other banks down all the way down the road. It's, um, there, is, there, are, there, are, there is Wells Fargo's around. There are, there are other, there are big banks around in North Dakota. They just don't dominate the way they dominate in every in every other state, country, or state or or, um, or markets. Um, awesome. And. You know, if I may leave you with one more fact of why is it important to have a stronger community banking sector? I mean, we don't even we don't even uh, realize a lot of us. You know, we just we know that that there's been consolidation in the banking sector, but let me tell you how bad it is. Uh, in the mid 1980s, there were 14,000 community banks in the U.S. Today, there's less than 5,000. Um, there were 40,000 banks community banks in the U.S. from the 1930s to the 1980s. Like it was, it was pretty steady for about 50 years, 14,000 community banks. Uh, and because of regulatory changes, we're down to less than 5,000 banks now in, in the United States. And so we have a really, you know, in, in North Dakota, what you, what you see is you have a stronger community bank sector. And the Bank of North Dakota, the state-owned bank and its model is a primary reason for that. Um, but it's really hard to get to, 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 to fund a bank initially. And so um, that's why it's really interesting to see now. And I know Raul is going to talk about the, the public banking act at the federal level, which will hopefully provide some of the startup capital that would be required for, for, for states and cities to start their own banks. Awesome. Thank you, Oscar. That was, thank you for that history. That was really helpful. And I hope that helps people realize the potential that these banks really have to make an impact and exemplified by, you know, the Bank of North Dakota's success. Uh, so next we'll move on to Raul. Um, so a few questions for you, Raul. Uh, can you speak to the work that you're doing spreading uh, public banking via federal legislation and namely the public banking proposal being advanced by representatives to Leib and Ocasio-Cortez. And then can you tell us how public banks can implement mechanisms to prevent co-optation by the same corporate interests that public banks co combat? 
Absolutely. Thanks very much. I'm happy to be here. I know we've had some tech issues, so can I just wonder hear me? We're hearing you. Okay. It's breaking up a little. Great. It's breaking right. up a little bit. So we'll continue. I will um Okay. I think it's good now. Okay. Camera. Yeah. Try try and speak now. Okay. So I'm very happy to chat about the Federal um, Public Banking Act uh, put forth by Representative um, Saeed. It's um, 8271 for those who are interested in looking at the details of the bill. First, I want to zoom out just a little bit and situate public banking in the context of the broader financial system. I think both Trinity and Oscar um, spoke very well to the impact of public banking. Um, but I think by contrasting it to what private banks can do and are doing and um, contrasting it to what public treasuries do, public, public budgeting does, is really helpful and maybe seems this makes this seem a lot less uh, wild to people, right? So at the, um, you know, the core of the, of the U.S. financial system, is essentially the U.S. government, um, as it is in most places. And the U.S. Treasury spends and it taxes and it procures and it provides grants, but it relies on the Federal Reserve, which is a creature of Congress and foundationally a public system, even if it's arguably um, been captured by um, quite a few private interests. It relies on the Federal Reserve to engage in uh, lending, in taking equity stakes and things, and more sophisticated operations that the Treasury does not do directly. Um, like Oscar said, it's um, you know in in the as in the Bank of North Dakota model, um, which was uh, which arose historically around the same time as the Fed. Um, the Fed is staffed by many bankers and folks with um, sophisticated knowledge primarily from Wall Street, which is actually, I would argue, a bad thing, um, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, but the Fed also followed a long legacy of, of fighting between, um, you know, sort of the plantation capitalists and the banker capitalists in antebellum America over what a public bank would look like. And public banks can look a lot of different ways. Um, you can have a very oppressive public bank. You can have a very nurturing and creative public bank that is invested in sustainable finance and communities. And we've seen that um, throughout the world, certainly in many places, um, Germany, in Brazil, um, the postal banking system in Japan. There are examples of public banking enterprises not only working, but being part of the very fabric of the financial system. But because in part of the United States, um, you know, racial capitalist and settler colonialist makeup, um, the banks that we have only do certain things, right? And they only serve certain people. Um, for a long time, it was sort of the Hamiltonians um, who wanted um, banks for the merchants fighting against, um, you know, people in the South who wanted hard money, who wanted minerals, who did not, who traded in hard goods, and they didn't have the sort of spreadsheet economy that the North did. Right. And this was really integral to the lead up to the Civil War. And that's that's fascinating and um, happy to recommend um, books to those people who want to read it. But the point is that even within U.S. history, uh, banking has looked a wild variety of different ways. And so situating current public banking movement within that history and within the localized histories like the one that Oscar shared, really, I think, makes this seem like not so much a radical departure from where we've been, but a reconfiguration, so to speak. 
and right now the system that we have, as Trinity said, does not work, right? The um, quote unquote public bank that we have at the federal level, the Federal Reserve, um, you know, sometimes does helpful things and very oftentimes, again, serves the interests of Wall Street and the financial elite to staff it and go in a revolving door around and around, right? And um, we have a government that is stingy with its treasury funds. And we have a legal system which does not really allow states to certainly not issue their own currency, but engage in sophisticated um, operations in the way that the federal government can. And then we have municipalities, which um, often do not have the balanced budget requirements of states. But, um, you know, if they want to raise funds, they resort to oppressive mechanisms like fines and fees, very rarely raise uh, property taxes. Um, we'll go into municipal debt, um, as Trinity was indicating about LA, um, you know, a terrible situation in Chicago, New York, elsewhere. Um, so there's really nowhere that is good for a generative um, economy focused on economic justice to form. There's nowhere to get this capital, right? And while I like um, many aspects of the Bank of North Dakota model, it arose out of the political circumstances of its time, which is also to say it did not arise out of a democracy in any sense or shape. And it arose um, at a time where these local farmers had captured the state government and thought it would be just to build a public that was closely tethered to the fiscal interests of the state. Not every locality is looking for that in, um, in the United States, right? And that's where the Public Banking Act comes in. It's to empower, yes, states, but also municipalities, um, especially municipalities that have different social justice interests and economic just, justice interests than the state capital and the state legislature to create their own source of um, their own balance sheet for growth, for sustainable growth, for cooperatives, for CDFIs, um, for community land trusts, for all that good stuff. Um, that's the model in New York, for instance, um, where I was part of the coalition for quite some time. Um, I don't speak for the now, but it is a point of reference for me um, because I think like in Trinity's example, it shows um, that grassroots efforts are not only the right way to go, um, uh, you know, morally or ethically, I would say, but strategically and really getting um, resiliency into the uh, vision of the bank and its design is absolutely critical. Um, and who is in the room really, really, really matters. So I would not actually like a bank um, staffed by community bankers because, you know, there are commercial banks and then there are community banks and there are CDFIs and then there are CDCUs and there's a spectrum, right? And in my experience, a lot of community bankers, especially in the South and the Midwest, actually do the worst kind of redlining. And it's made, um, it's exacerbated by the familiarity they have with folks. So what the Federal Public Banking Act does is it seeks to incubate banks that meet certain standards, right? And a lot of these are already present in the grassroots because we worked on this bill um, specifically with um, Trinity and the California folks, the New York folks, et cetera. And what it does is it provides a separate chartering stream and a separate regulatory stream for, for uh, public banks that cannot get chartered by their state, right? or for state chartered public bank or for state banks that want to hook up to the Federal Reserve mainframe, right? It's still a political battle where we have to fight, but if we pass um, the squad's uh, Public Banking Act, which is also co-sponsored by many people not in the squad and, and does have some pool in the middle, um, then what we can do is um, start to create the right kind of public bank that we want to see. My one final note um, before I wrapped up, before I wrap up is just, um, that uh, banks can, again, also be oppressive and not just in terms of the debt they extract, is in which they may access to credit a, a poverty mechanism that it shouldn't be, as um, Daniel Del Rio, who you all heard from earlier, uh, from New Economy Project says, you can't product design product uh, poverty way, right? Bosses have to pay more, governments have to pay more. We have to restructure the economy fundamentally and the public bank is not going to solve everything, nor are loans. And more importantly, um, for especially vulnerable communities, 
bank accounts are not always the answer because bank accounts are not private. And if they're not private in the way that um, cash or digital equivalent of cash would be. And so it's very important in these public banking design efforts that there is also a, a place for giving people wallets, digital wallets, lock boxes for paper cash, et cetera. Because a lot of communities on the periphery deserve some distance between themselves and, and um, the uh, banking surveillance apparatus that necessarily hands over financial information to not only the NSA, but local cops. And that's especially important here in Miami, um, the war on cash and the war to end the surveillance of poor people or to um, in, involve all everybody in a sort of dragnet, even under ostensibly noble principles, um, in many ways started here in Miami. Um, the war on cash and anti-money laundering law has always had a very racialized foundation. Uh, um, it's very obvious what it means. And um, the war on cash is key to the war on drugs and the war on terror. So that's just a plea again to the bigger theme of the design of these banks matters. And um, hopefully this bill that we're pushing, which um, some of you is um, building the kind of banks, that, public banks that we want to see. Thanks. Thank you, Raul. That is very interesting work. And it looks you know, like it goes hand in hand with you know, some of these state initiatives and we'll really help that out. So unfortunately, in the interest of time, uh, we had a few questions, but we're, we're just gonna save those. And um, if you do have questions, you can email us um, and we will answer those um, when we get a chance. Um, so I just wanted to thank all the speakers and attendees and I wanted to remind everybody here that there's a lot more of these great talks happening. Uh, the community controlled initiative session is tomorrow at 1 p.m. So come by, learn about more opportunities to get involved, more community initiatives. Uh, again, I wanted to thank everybody and have a good night. <laughs>